You even get to the point where you start rating your friends based on how they eat. I wish I had a, a recording device on me. I was at a Subway uh, submarine sandwich shop about two weeks ago, and there was some high school kids sitting there, and I was eavesdropping because that's what I do when I'm in any restaurant. I don't, I don't know why. And they were talking about someone who was not there, and I just heard, she's really, really funny, and then someone else said, yeah, but she eats like crap. So she's funny, but apparently that, that doesn't count nearly as much as the fact that she eats like crap. And the scary thing is, though, think about it. These are high school kids, so they're 14, 15. And we're, are, we, are we helping people with all this nutrition information we're constantly bombarding them with? I look around. I know we have some grad students here today. We have some doctors. We have some trainers. Uh, the number one rule of medicine, number one rule, is above all else, I like to add in the else, above all else, do no harm. That's something I really want everybody here to consider if you're in the position where you're consulting people or giving nutrition advice, is that when you start giving so much advice that people start judging their self-worth, self having problems talking, or the worth of other people based on their diet, I think we might be doing harm. So OCE and weight loss, and this is the, the interesting thing, is that OCE can actually prevent you from getting your weight loss goals. When you start spending all your time and energy thinking about what to eat, when to eat, how to eat, with what people to eat, with what combinations to eat, with how much and what combinations of red and green vegetables, etc., we forget to think about how much we should be eating. So when we're in a lineup and we're trying to decide whether it should be a whole wheat bagel, a sesame seed bagel, sourdough bagel, because that new research on sourdough, and we start really, really getting caught up on that, maybe forget to ask ourselves, hey, do I really need a full bagel or could I just have a half? And, and that's the sort of thing that happens when we're really delving into this belief that there's magical properties associated with food. Because let's not kid ourselves. What these sound bites and, and little bits of research that you see all the time in the news are telling us foods can do is nothing short of magic. So OCE starts in a way that is very innocent. These are all good things, wanting to overcome chronic illness, wanting to lose weight, improve health, or even correct a bad diet. Nothing wrong with that. This is what I want to make sure that everybody understands. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do that. It's when this becomes an obsession that we have to start questioning the health benefit. So we really want to look at a healthy, balanced diet includes the mental aspect of food. And don't, don't for one minute misconstrue my message that I am all for a healthy diet. I like fruits and vegetables. I think they're great. I also don't think there's anything wrong with having a Snickers every once in a while. And if, heaven forbid, you go to a kid's birthday party and you have chocolate cake, you should not be upset for weeks over that one little snack. So that's the main message here, is that OCE can start very, very simple and build into something very, very bad. And at its worst, this is when self-discipline turns into self-punishment. And self-discipline is something we look at fitness models, and bodybuilders, we go, wow, they are disciplined. I mean, they don't miss a workout. They eat on a schedule. I hear his alarm go off on his watch, and he go, rips out his Tupperware container and eats his chicken breast and broccoli. But what we don't realize is that when he doesn't do that, the self-punishment, what, what he or she puts themselves through is pretty scary. And then when it actually turns into self-condemnation, and they actually start viewing themselves as a lesser person because of missing their timed meals, or, or not having you know, the broccoli in combination with the cauliflower that they wanted. This gets to be very extreme. And we, I'm sure we can all agree that at this point, we're reaching a level that's certainly not healthy. OK, so this is, I know this is pretty heavy, but again, what I want to do here is break down walls. And, and I also want to point out that it's, it's not like this is just something we're doing to ourselves. It is largely because of incorrect use of science as marketing. And science as marketing is something I'm amazing at. And I won't lie, when I was in the supplement building, the supplement industry, I could take a tidbit of information from a research study, we could take the one little sound bite, put it on a label, put it on an advertising campaign, and I, you would read that and you would want to buy that product. It is a skill that is taught, and these people are amazingly, amazingly good at it. But it's something you have to be aware of when you're trying to sort of simplify this down to just moving forward and losing weight in a way that's simple and easy. Uh, science and marketing, here's two quick examples. Okay, first one is very simple. Anybody who's doing graduate research, and I notice people here are doing it, understand this. 
Science is trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have the picture of what the puzzle is. You have no clue what it's supposed to look like. So it's a thousand piece puzzle. One piece in your hand, you can take a look at that piece and you say, this is definitely blue. And I can tell by the shape it's definitely not the edge. And a mistake happens when you don't have a lot of time to obviously go through and find a thousand other, other studies because you have a deadline. So what you do, you just get into your, your little computer and you type up your story about that puzzle and say, the puzzle's blue, has no edges. And, and that's what happens. Little tidbits of information from one study, from two, maybe even three, get turned into a story. And then to make sure that the story isn't actually inaccurate, words like may, possibly, contribute, are added into the story. But the words you see is Burns body fat. So this one little piece of the puzzle may possibly contribute to burning body fat turns into this burns body fat in our minds. And we have to be very careful of, of this type of research as we read it and as we expose people to it that it's not contributing to a lot of misinformation that's actually hurting their weight loss potential. All right, so in 2009, this is the point I'm getting down to. The number one cause of OCE the number one thing I believe is going to be misunderstood, misconstrued, over-marketed, over-hyped is going to be the word metabolism. And metabolism marketing. You're going to see this all over the place. So your metabolism is it's a very vague term. I mean, it's very vague. What it actually means is all the chemical processes in your body. That's your metabolism. Right now, it has nothing to do with calories. Chemical processes, things being built up, things being broken down. Things that were broken down, being taken somewhere else, be built back up again. It's just one big cycle. It's made up of thousands and thousands of little cycles. That's your metabolism. Still very vague, I understand. So visual learners, wow. That's not, not quite how I wanted it to look, but it looks better in your slides. Anabolism is basically the idea of building things up. Catabolism is the idea of breaking things down, put them together. That's your metabolism. Really important note right here. Anabolism doesn't necessarily mean good. And catabolism, which is just this horrible word right now in the world of sports fitness, does not mean bad. Now, the difference here is the energetic cost, because it costs your body energy to do just about everything. The energetic cost of your metabolism is your metabolic rate. And that's what people talk to. When they say metabolism, that's what they mean. They typically are talking about the amount of calories you are burning in a given period of time. We work on a 24-hour clock, so it's typically in a 24-hour period. Energy expenditure, metabolic rate, is what people are most interested in. Unfortunately, we all say metabolism because it's a better buzzword. And I'm not immune to this. If you ever go to my website, eatstopeat.com, I say, does not slow your metabolism, which actually makes no sense. It should be metabolic rate, but it's neither there nor here. All right, so two things that increase your metabolic rate. Losing muscle mass. Losing muscle mass costs energy. Building up body fat also costs energy. So here are two things that we would definitely not consider to be good that boost your metabolism. So all of a sudden, right now, I want you to start thinking, huh, so maybe all that marketing about things that boost my metabolism might be right, might actually boost my metabolism, might not be something I want. I mean, I could design a supplement for you that would eat away at protein in your muscle and cause you to gain fat and tell you to boost your metabolism. I don't think it's going to sell very well. So just keep in mind that things that boost your metabolism aren't always amazing. Understanding energy expenditure, that's probably the biggest topic for today because it's really, we break this down, we can build up just an amazing approach to weight loss and healthy eating. This is really your energy expenditure just sort of messed up with arrows all over the place, but it comes from a ver variety of areas where your body needs energy to f fuel the chemical processes that make you a living person. Uh, if you're not a living person, this doesn't mean anything to you because that's the difference. I mean, it's, it's life. That's what costs energy, and we get that energy typically from either our body fat stores or the food we eat. The interesting thing here, and I hope these are a lot better on your slides, is that it's the breakdown of what costs energy that, that really is eye-opening. Uh, right now, everybody's sitting, you know, you're paying attention, hopefully, so your brains are working. 60 to 70% of the calories you burn in a day just from doing what you're doing right now. Because this is a complex machine, and we are all extremely complex machines. It takes a lot of energy just to run you. Now, you add in some movement, like me sort of nervously shifting around up here, that costs more energy. And that's where we get this down here, the movement area. 
20 to 40%, which you think about it, is not that